Today's scripture reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, 16 through 17, 22, and 22 through 25. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but serve each other through love. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit, and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other, so you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. When I was a young man, and that was more than just a few years ago, there was a uh, fair that we used to go to. It's called the Ionia Free Fair. And it was in a city called Ionia, and it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. Um, you could spend a week there and really not see the same things very much twice or three times. And uh, we'd go, and it was a big time. They had the midway. Now, I don't know. Have, just work with me. If you've been to a carnival, a large carnival, not the store parking lot carnivals, big carnival, or the fair, uh, and, and there's the midway. And it's all the lights, and it's all the games, and it's all the sideshows, and all the barkers, and all the, the hawkers, and they're yelling and trying to get your attention. You got five bucks in your pocket, you save for a year, and here you go, you know, you're going to play something, you're going to win something, you're going to see something, and they're all pulling, and they're all asking, and you're hearing it all the time. Step right this way, come right here, hey, come here. And then another one's over here. Hey, kid, want to win something for your girly girlfriend there? Come here, come here, come here. I got a deal for you. Another guy's going, hey, hey, Sonny, come, uh, come here. We want to see things only princes and kings have ever seen before. It's traveled the world. It's from Egypt. You've never seen anything. It's hairy. It's ugly. It's whatever it is, you know. Come on, come on. And, and we tease us in. And then you hear another guy, hey, I got a deal for you. It's real easy, kid. Everything wins. Every time wins. You can't lose. Come here. And that's one thing after another. Look over here, look over there, step this way, don't step that way, come back, come back. What are you afraid of? Ever done that? You feel like you live in that carnival every day? A little bit? You got work, you got school, you got family, you got church, you got kids, you got vacations, you got chores, you got details, and more and more and more until you look up one day and you realize I don't have my five dollars anymore. I didn't win a prize and they're ready to close up. And you go home and the voices don't stop. They keep you awake till three, even though you're exhausted. Fast and Furious isn't just how they drive in movies. It describes the onslaught of living that we live in and it is faster these days. I just did a cursory look at some of the ways it's changed. The books, they print over 300,000 books are printed every year, and an additional million books are printed in unconventional ways. I, when I grew up, there was three channels, three on TV, that was it. And then it kind of grew to 12, and if you counted the UHF thing, whatever that was, 900 stations now, 900. And half of them our carnival barkers and hawkers saying, stay on this channel. Come over here and look at this. Give it another shot. Every minute of every day, listen to me, every minute of every day, 72 hours of new video is posted on YouTube. Every minute of every day, 3 million new pieces of content are pushed into Facebook. 
every minute of every day, a quarter million pictures are put on Instagram. Every minute, every day, day after day, day after day, day after day. It's just crowding in. Do you know what an exabyte is? You know what a, a byte is. It's a byte, a computer byte. It's eight bits of data. One bit is eight bits of data. An exabyte is one billion billion bytes. It is said often that if you took every word uttered from the dawn of human development, creation, all the way up to 2011, I mean every word uttered and spoken by every person on the globe from all that time, it would fill five exabytes of computer memory. Today and tomorrow, we will create an additional five exabytes. And we will do that every two days. Boom, boom, boom. Bigger, faster, more, more, and more. How in the world are we supposed to keep up? The text that we read this morning, or was read and beautifully done, by the way, gives a little bit of insight that I'd like to explore. Now, I want to look at the author for a minute, Paul. Stay with me. I just want you to let you in on something. Don't, don't go away. Paul is teaching his readers, his, his listeners, how to reduce distraction in the Christian life. It was a very complex time. Jesus came, listen, it was, the, 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 the Hebrew people and the Jewish law was enormous. Laws alone, 613 laws, commandments, 613 commandments, commandments broken down into two categories, things you have to do, things you shouldn't do. And then they prioritized those 1,226 items, and they would argue for days, and if there were 50 rabbis in the room, there were also 50 different opinions about what was the highest and what was the best and what was most important and what shouldn't and what should. And they saw Jesus one day and they said, let's get him to straighten us out because we know if he says one thing of the 50, maybe one will agree, the other 49 will not like him anymore and we can win one for complexity and Pharisees and arrogance and rudeness and self-righteousness. Jesus, what's the greatest law? Well, first off, there's only two, Jesus said. Boy, that took them right out from under their feet. What happened to the other 611? But there's only two. The first one is love the Lord God with every fiber of your being and do not stop. And the second one is just like it. Take care of each other. Take care of each other like you love each other. And that was it. If you get distracted in any way, just stay on those two points, those two thoughts. Love God with everything you got, take care of each other, and go forward. Paul teaches that Christianity is specific and clear, and so when your life is chaotic, focus. Jesus taught, to be, a, to be blessed, you have to be a blessing. To receive love, give love. To be honored, first be humble. To truly live in Christ, die to yourself. To gain the unseen, let go of what you can see. To receive, first give. To save your life, lose it. To lead, be a servant. To be first, be last. Here are the things to remember. The fruit of the Spirit living as God's disciple are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. But here's the thing. <laughs> Lord knows. We can say it. We can read it. We can memorize it. We can draw pictures of it. We can do all kinds of things with it. But living it seems to be a little tricky. As hard as we work at it, 
we continue to drift. And I guess Paul suggests that the reason we drift is because we're up against the primary obstacle of our own selfish impulses. We want to play the games on the midway. We want to go to the shooting gallery. We want to throw the little rings. We want to see the strangeness. We want to be a part of all that. And at the end of the day, you've got nothing except you're tired and hardly hurt. You were called to freedom, my brothers and sisters, only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge selfish impulses, but serve each other through love, be guided by the Spirit, and then you don't have to worry about it. Clearly, Paul keeps teaching this. He teaches it through Romans. He teaches it through the Corinthians. He teaches it through Philippians. He teaches it through Galatians. Always the same song. Build up your mind. Govern your attitude. Work to have the mind of Christ. And he has to do it all the time because it's a sticking point. As hard as we try, we keep drifting. There are so many things to look at. And there are so many options and so many distractions that we wander off and we follow the wrong God's home. I want you to hear me this. Now listen to this here. Wherever you are in your personal faith walk, your faith development, I want you to remember this. We are all under construction. We are all en route. We all are works in progress. We all need each other. Please don't ever forget that. Nobody's done. Some of us have open wounds that are still healing. Some of us have scars that have healed, but it has twisted us into a new understanding of how we live. Some of us are just prone to stumbling. And some of us are in the middle of a disorienting wilderness and we don't know where to turn. But all of us are on this adventure of life with a commitment and dedication to each other. We covenant with one another. And as hard as we work at it, we still drift slowly but apart, gently, but away. We just look up one day and realize we're more alone than connected, more apart than together, more distant than close, more shattered than whole. And what is the key? Since it's here, right here. The key is as soon as you sense you're drifting, when the fruits of your life are sourness and frustration and grumpy and angry and frustrated and anxious and mean change course correct your course reconnect with your christian coordinates realign where all disciples of christ are called to be the good news of the christian faith is you are never too far away to find back to main course you are never so far away that you can't get back. It's just a matter of getting there. But hear this. As a result, it's not the distance of the drift that matters. It's how well and how soon you correct. I'll tell you a story. And I have family over here, and three of them know this story is true. Um, We would go with the seniors uh, class. We would take them. I used to do youth work years ago. And um, we'd take the seniors on a trip every year. They'd pick the trip they wanted. They always chose the same trip. Uh, We'd drive them down to Fort Lauderdale and we'd rent a big sailboat. Now I'm talking a 52 footer, a big Irwin, a nice wooden basket. Enjoy. Lovely boats. And they always come with a captain. Now a boat like that, we'd get in, we'd sail to the Bahamas and we'd spend a week there. It's your hotel, everybody's got a room, it's your restaurant, the galley works, everybody eats, and it's your, it's your vehicle too. And it's a marvelous way to spend a week, talk with the kids, remember your baptism, talk, have those conversations, you're going to college, it'd be a wonderful thing. But first you have to get to the Bahamas. So we'd get in this boat, it was a, always a night crossing. Now, here's Florida, just imagine. Let me see where you're on. That's Florida, yes, that worked, Florida. And over here's the Bahamas, okay? Now, relatively speaking, the Bahamas are that, and this is Florida. And you're going to sail from here into there. Now, there's a giant thing underneath the water. I'm not talking about the Bermuda Triangle, I'm talking about the Gulf Stream. It pushes everything north. Everything goes north. And so, 
you have to anticipate that because a boat that's sailing in it will go up. And so if you started here and just sailed straight to here, you would be up here. And 600 miles into your journey, you, you'd be in the middle of the Atlantic and thinking, I, I think we should be here by now. I, I think we should have been found it. So you have, to, what they do is they, they, they go south. And then you cross, and as you rise, you come to where you need to be. Well, that's all science. Where you just, just go south and go over, right? There's other forces. This is the bow of the boat. A wave hits it. Now the bow of the boat's going this way. You've got no indication. If I stand here, I'm looking at that wall, and now I'm here, I say, now I know I'm looking out the windows. But when there is nothing but darkness, and nothing but water, and nothing to see, and nowhere to judge it, you don't know if you turned very far or not. The compass is your secret ingredient. For the old sailors, it was our benefit. We, every time you rent a sailboat of that size, it comes with a captain. And in the captain's quarters, you've got a little radio and a low rain and a and weatherman and ship to shore. He's got all these little things in there. And uh, he, he says, okay. He comes up. He says, y'all are going to be in two-hour shifts. Two people on the wheel. Up, you know, take turns. And there's this giant lit compass right in front of you. Now, it's got a, um, they call it the compass card. It's that thing in there that has all the lines on it that says north, south, east, and west and it moves. It's in a glass, water-filled, gimbaled type affair, and so it flips and flops and moves freely. So when the boat tips this way, it tips that way. And when the stern goes that way, it goes this way. It moves all the time, never stops. And the captain says, all right, first shift, I want you to set the course at 100 degrees, and we'll, we'll just, you just do that for two hours. Well, let me tell you what. First time you try that, you realize you're not going to, I just, no. You, you have this wheel, you have this enormous boat, and you're trying to keep the point on 100 degrees, and you just take a sip of coffee, say hello to the person you're next to, and now you're doing 90 degrees, and you don't know when that happened or how. Uh, but you're not right. And you're going, oh, all right, I have to make up 10 degrees. So what do you do? Well, you can't go back to 100, because that's your step, so you go back to 110. And you kind of guess how long that'll take. And then you kind of slip it back to 100. And of course, you can't hit 100, so you landed at 98. So now you've got to go back to 102. And this goes on for two hours. Captain wakes up, comes up, does his little magic. OK. Next crew come in. I want you to put it on 110. OK. Same drill for two hours. It's 126, it's eight. You know, your boat's going crazy, you're nuts. And a two-foot swell is a wonderful ride. A 10-foot swell, everybody's on the deck puking their guts out, you know. <laughs> so you got a lot of things going on here. And it's pitch black. Every two hours, captain resets. Every two hours, you struggle like the devil. And in dawn, it, there it is. There, you can see the islands. They just keep getting bigger and bigger. There's the Bahamas. Now, friends, it takes 12 hours to make that passage. For 12 hours, we weren't on course for more than two minutes. But we got to where we needed to be. Why? Because we corrected quickly and often. That's all Paul is trying to offer us here. The distraction of lights are not going to go away. You will be continually pulled and pushed. And to my graduates, you have such an exciting opportunity ahead of you. But you will be pulled, and you will be pushed, and you will drift. And my message to you is to correct as quickly as you can. Will you, all of you, examine your heart today? Will you choose a course correction that brings you out of the drifting tides of distracted day-to-day -day living? Here's the correction marks on your compass. Be more loving. Go there if you need to. Or maybe you need to be closer to more joyful. Or maybe it's time to be more peaceful. Or maybe more patient. Or more kind. Or more good. More faithful. Be more gentle have more self-control.
It's easier if you don't wait too long. Amen.